Welcome to another episode of Figuring Out Fertility. My name is Carolyn Dubé. I'm the Executive Director with Fertility Matters Canada. And I am here today with a very special guest. Uh, Sarah Cohen is a reproductive or fertility lawyer here in Canada, and she's also the president of Fertility Matters Board of Directors. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Carolyn. Uh, so yes, as Carolyn said, my name is Sarah Cohen. My practice is Fertility Law Canada. Good afternoon to everyone or good morning, depending on where you are in the country. I am also really proud of being the president of Fertility Matters Canada. And I'm so glad you guys could join us, especially on Canadian Fertility Awareness Week. Uh, we have so many interesting programs and informative programs available to you. So I'm glad you're here joining me today, but please also join us for many of the other ones that are coming up. I'm going to be speaking to you today about the makings of the modern family, surrogacy and gamete donation in Canada. If you give me one second, I'm technologically inept. I'm going to put up my slides and then we're going to go through this for you. Oh, whoops. I already messed up. That's okay. I have to press share screen first. Oh, it's not showing as an option. That's hmm. okay. Weird. Right. Let me figure out why that is. It's uh, okay. Let me turn open this on and off again. I'm really sorry for everyone who's waiting. It's no problem. It's actually a good time for me to say if you're watching live on Facebook or Zoom, please know that Sarah will be taking your questions live today. So you can leave a message in um, in the chat box on Zoom or in the comment section, <clears throat> which I will be monitoring. Uh, on Facebook. So if you have any questions at all, please do not hesitate to ask. If you'd like to private message us on Zoom, um, that's okay too. We're happy to kind of moderate those. Okay, we're going to try this one more time. Mm -hmm. I'm so embarrassed and I appreciate everyone Don't for be. holding off on this for me. Don't be embarrassed. It is not here anymore. I don't know why. Okay. That's okay. So I'm going to do it without showing you my slides and I'm just going to talk. So that's I'm okay. So, I'm I've so, given. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I should have had it's, you. If you want to email them to me while, while you begin and then I can bring them up on the screen, we can do that too. Oh yeah, sure. I'll send them to you if it makes it okay. easier. Um, so this, but is, this is but, how Sarah is. She's so lovely to work with and it's so easy. So I'm, everybody will be happy with any information and uh, you email those to me. I'll bring them up on screen and we'll just catch up. Okay, I apologize. So it's thanks no everyone problem. for being so patient. And as Sarah mentioned, it is Canadian Infertility Awareness Week. And so um, we have all kinds of events happening every single day. So every day at 2 p.m. Uh, Atlantic, 1 p.m. Eastern, and typically around between 7 and 8 uh, p.m. Eastern in the evening, we've got fertility experts across the country speaking on all kinds of different topics as well as our partners who are also putting on events. So it might not be live on our Fertility Matters Canada Facebook page, but you will find it on, um, on lots of partners pages. So if you visit us on Facebook in our event section, everything is listed there and you can get more information at ciaw.ca. Okay. So thanks everyone. I'm going to start anyways. And Carolyn has my slides at some point they will pop up and, uh, I'm happy to talk anyway. So I've kind of done a format for this presentation and almost a question and answer format because I find that works really well and people have a lot of questions for a fertility lawyer. So the first thing people ask me all the time is what is a fertility lawyer and who do you work for? So a fertility lawyer works for intended parents, surrogates, donors, and those can be egg donors, sperm donors, or embryo donors. And our patients, or our, actually it's not really patients for us, it's our clients. Some of them are heteronormative, some of them are non-heteronormative, some of them are single, transgender, polyamorous, multi-parent families. And we do a lot of different things, including um, preconception agreements. So most of the agreements that we do are gonna be surrogacy agreements, egg donor agreements, and sperm donor agreements. Um, but we also do post-birth legal parentage processes, as well as uh, I personally work for some of the clinics and cryobanks, hospitals, and gamete distributors. So you can move on to the next slide, Carolyn. Thank you. So all the time I'm asked, when should I consult a fertility lawyer? And the best advice I can give you is you should do that as soon as possible. Most fertility lawyers in Canada will offer you a free consultation. So it's really in your best interest to talk to someone as soon as possible. Um, it's not going to hurt you in any way. It's just, you know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes of your time. Um, the difference between speaking with a lawyer and speaking with an agency or a clinic, etc., is the lawyer only works for you. 
So the lawyer is not also working for a surrogate, not also working for a donor, not also working for an agency, but only representing your interests and has a fiduciary duty to do that to the best of their ability. And part of the reason it's so important to talk to a lawyer early is so that you don't go down the wrong path and have to start all over again or backtrack, which can be both very expensive, but also emotionally devastating. So there are legal implications throughout. So you're going to have questions like, for example, I found a donor and I'm not ready to enter into a contract yet with her. Um, but um, she has expenses that she's incurring before we have this contract. Am I allowed to reimburse her? What does that look like? So you want to talk to your lawyer about that. You want to talk to your lawyer about things like, is it legal to work with a surrogacy agency and this particular surrogacy agency? And then there's actual differences between the provinces about who is a parent. So for example, you don't want to accidentally do surrogacy um, in a place where you have to have a genetic connection to the child if you don't have a genetic connection to the child. And you want to find that out sooner rather than later so that you don't end up with a a, a big mess down the road. I'm going to jump to the next slide, please. So who needs a fertility lawyer? And that's anyone who's working with a surrogate or a donor. Um, and that people ask me, can I work with, can I have my surrogate work with you too if I'm working with you, if I'm the intended parent? And the answer is no, it's a conflict of interest. So not only does Ontario law in particular actually makes it clear that we have to have two different lawyers, um, but that's also the case when we're having egg donors, or sperm donors, or embryo donors. Although we're all coming together to build a family together, um, it's really important that everyone has different lawyers because we still have different um, interests that we have to protect. Um, one exception to that is often when people do multi-parent family agreements, people do all together have the same lawyer. Um, they can get independent legal advice if they want to, but they don't have to. Okay, we can jump off the next one. So. Most of the work that I do is third party reproduction, which is just a really fancy way of talking about surrogacy, gamete donation, which is also a fancy way of talking about egg and sperm donation and embryo donation. And third party reproduction really just means a situation where you have a third party, so a person who does not intend to be a parent, helping you to become a parent. Next slide, please. So what do I need to know about surrogacy law before I begin? And I'm gonna focus a lot on surrogacy at the beginning, but I'm also gonna be speaking about egg donation and sperm donation, a little less about embryo donation, just because there's less of it done in the country and I don't have very much time today. Um, although I do cutting in and segueing here for a second, embryo donation or known embryo donation is some of my favorite work that I do. I think it's a fabulous option. Happy to talk about that too, if people are interested. Um, but most of the, what I'm gonna talk about right now is surrogacy, then I'll move to egg and sperm donation. So there's federal law and then there's provincial law. And the federal law is the same across the country. Provincial law differs province to province. Across the country, a surrogate must be at least 21 years old or older, and a donor has to be at least 18 years or older. So it's illegal to pay a surrogate for her services, and it's illegal to purchase eggs or sperm from a donor or a person acting on behalf of a donor. That's a little different than with embryos. With embryos, it's just plain illegal to purchase or sell, uh, purchase or sell embryos at all. It doesn't matter who you're purchasing or selling from or to. A bit more confusing part that we'll talk about later is that it's illegal to pay someone to arrange for the services of a surrogate mother or accept consideration for doing so. While it is illegal to pay someone, it is possible to reimburse someone for their out-of-pocket expenses for categories that are listed in the regulations. Um, and this is relatively new that we have these categories listed in regulations by Health Canada, and they tell us what we are allowed to reimburse a surrogate and a donor in Canada. Um, something you should also know is that it's illegal to pay for net lost wages of a surrogate during a pregnancy, other than where the doctor certifies in writing she must miss work in order to protect her health or that of the fetus. Provincial law, on the other hand, answers the question of who is a parent, and it answers that question differently province to province. I'm going to look at that a little bit more detail later, but for now I just want you to keep in mind that provincial law differs in the sense that some provinces require that there be a genetic connection to at least one parent to make you a parent. Some provinces recognize multi-parent families, while other provinces only recognize two parents. Um, in some provinces, it might be dangerous to do donation because the donor could be a parent. In other provinces, it's really quite safe. Um, and the question of how to make someone a parent through surrogacy is totally different province by province. So the most important piece of the law, if you don't know anything about surrogacy law, is Section 6 of the Assisted Human Production Act, which is the part where it says no person shall pay consideration or offer to be paid. The person has to be at least 21 years old or older, and it's illegal to um, accept consideration for arranging the services of a surrogate mother or pay consideration for arranging the services of a surrogate mother. And when we talk about surrogacy agencies, I'm going to look at this in a little bit more detail soon. So 
The reason we know we're allowed to reimburse a surrogate, though, is we have Section 12 of the Act, which says that in accordance with the regulations, you are entitled to reimburse a surrogate mother for expenses and for loss of work-related income during a pregnancy if a doctor certifies in writing that continuing to work may pose a risk to her health or that of the embryo or the fetus. Next slide, please. Um, so Health Canada's regulations spell out for us uh, things that we are allowed to reimburse a surrogate, and that includes travel, counseling, whether that be genetic counseling, legal counseling, dependent care, whether that be a child or an adult dependent, products or services recommended in writing by healthcare provider. And this new limitation on things that are recommended in writing by healthcare provider can be a little onerous. So we actually have to have someone in writing recommend things like uh, if you need um, uh, whether it's prenatal massage or whether it's, um, you know, special hosiery to support you during a pregnancy that has to be in writing, maternity clothes, um, insurance. But the big thing that's missing was net lost wages in the postpartum phase. And this doesn't make a lot of sense because obviously when someone gives birth to a child, um, they're going to need some time to recuperate. Uh, so Health Canada did provide something called a guidance document, which does not have the force of law, but it is relatively safe to rely on that says in their opinion, Opinion, reimbursing a surrogate for her net lost wages in the postpartum phase is not contravention of Section 6 of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act. Sarah, I have a question yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. So does that mean if a, after a surrogate gives birth, she's not able to, um, would she be eligible for if she was working um, prior to and had um, EI, I apologize, I assume it would be EI, would she be yeah. able to take mater or maternity? Is that the initial? Yeah. That initial time, is she, is she eligible for that? So it's a great question. And this is part of the reason why this is so contradictory. She is eligible for maternity leave. She's not eligible for parental leave. So the first 17 weeks are for her to take if she needs to take them. Most surrogates take about six weeks. Um, some of them take a little bit less time. Rarely do they take more. But it is legal up to 17 weeks for a surrogate to take off and be eligible for maternity leave. The question really is, are the intended parents allowed to top her up if she's eligible for employment insurance or if she's not eligible for employment insurance or other maternity wage loss benefits, can they reimburse her for her entire out-of-pocket amount? I understand. That, thank you for clearing that up. No problem. Next one, please. So what is surrogacy? I probably should have explained that earlier. Surrogacy is when a person carries a baby on behalf of someone else and they don't intend to be parents of that baby. Um, but there's two kinds of surrogacy. There's gestational surrogacy, which is where the surrogate has no genetic connection to the baby. And then there's traditional surrogacy, which is where the surrogate does have genetic connection to the baby. And that can be done through IUI insemination or just through um, IVF as well, using her own egg. People seem to have a misconception that traditional surrogacy is illegal in Canada, and that's not the case. Traditional surrogacy is legal, and it's done frequently, although not nearly as frequently as gestational surrogacy. And the legal process looks the same. There's actually no distinguishment in any of the provinces on the parentage rules with respect to gestational surrogacy versus traditional surrogacy. Next one, please. So how do I find a surrogate, and is a surrogacy agency legal? So I guess in some ways, one of the easiest or most obvious ways to find a surrogate is through friends or family. Not everyone, though, is lucky enough to have a best friend or a cousin or, you know, whoever that they know who's offering to carry on their behalf. I have had clients who've been very brave and have gone online offering to, um, looking for a surrogate, basically, and cannot offer to pay. You have to make sure the person you're talking to is at least 21 years or older, but you are allowed to look online for a surrogate. And it does happen sometimes, but it is a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. It can be difficult. It can be dangerous, uh, but it is possible. And I've seen some wonderful uh, stories happen that way too. And then the last question is a lot of people rely on agencies and there is a gray area around agencies in Canada and people don't like to admit that there's a gray area, but there is, and I don't think there should be. The law should be very clear on this. I believe all agencies should be perfectly legal the same way we have adoption agencies in Canada that are perfectly legal. Many of the agencies are legal in Canada. Some are not. It depends on the way the agency operates. So the law says that it's illegal to pay someone to arrange for the services of a surrogate mother, but it doesn't define what that is to arrange the service services of a surrogate mother, and we have no case law on that. So that's actually a, a difficult part for intended parents who are going through surrogacy um, to participate in, and it's very hard for them to have a clear and effective answer on that point. Sarah, I have a question about that because sure. I do, um, I wonder about that sometimes. So if you were 
uh, an intended parent and you were looking to use an agency, how would you know, or what, what would the things be that you would look for to make you feel confident um, that that agency was a good fit and that everything, um, that all the work that the agency was doing was gonna keep everybody safe? Okay, so the first part that I have to tell people and people don't like to hear is there's always going to be some risk working with an agency that none of them are, you know, because we just don't have any case law. So I can't tell you that this is perfectly fine. I think there are some agencies that are riskier than others. So there's currently, I would say two models, although there's many other models, but two models that um, if I'm giving a quick answer that I think you can look for that are um, going to be legal under that aspect of the law. Um, as long as we assume nobody's paying the surrogate, because that's for sure illegal. But one model is someone's not actually arranging the services of a surrogate mother. They're basically offering you a, a format or an online service where you can match yourself and find your own surrogate. And that's one option. Another option is you don't actually pay anything until you've actually matched with a surrogate. And you're only paying for services that come thereafter. I can't tell you that either of these are perfectly legitimate just because we don't have any experience with case law with it. Um, and I, I, this is a very fast answer. I'd feel much more comfortable if people spoke to me directly or spoke Absolutely. to a different lawyer directly and actually went through and talked about the risks associated. Um, I do think it's like to not use a very hyperbolic word. I think it's a bit of a travesty that this is the state of our law. I think the same way that adoption agencies are perfectly legitimate in Canada, even though you can't buy a baby through adoption, even if we have only um, altruistic surrogacy in Canada, I think it's really important that we regulate um, and get rid of any gray area about these agencies. Absolutely. And I guess that goes back to why point number one that you made was the very first step that you need to do if you're considering surrogacy or gamete uh, donation is connecting with a lawyer. I think it's a great idea. And there's lots of good ones. and Most of them offer free consultation. So please, please make sure you do so early on in the process. So people ask me who chooses to be a surrogate? If you can't pay a surrogate, why would someone choose to do this? And most of the people who I see, or let's talk first about the empirical evidence, then I'll tell you what I see. But the empirical evidence is that most surrogates are Caucasian, Christian, late 20s, early 30s. Most have finished high school, some are university educated. They have modest but not low family income and relatively stable financial situations. And that women of color are greatly underrepresented as surrogate mothers. This research though is already about 10 years old. So let me tell you now, if we flip to the next slide, what I'm seeing. So generally I am seeing the same thing, except I'm seeing a lot more people of color um, who are participating as surrogates in Canada than I used to see. People that I tend to see who are surrogates are stay-at-home moms or nurses, teachers, doulas, midwives, etc. So people who are already in helping professions. Um, surrogates actually tend to feel very good about what they do, and they often do it repeatedly and sometimes for the same family to have a sibling. And I find these women to be smart, educated, really knowledgeable, and really make sure they know what they're doing before they get into this. So I'm actually very impressed by the surrogacy community. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Oops. There we go. So what else should I talk about with a surrogate before we draft the contract? And these are the things I want you to think about before drafting contract. First of all, how many embryos are we transferring at a time? Most people transfer one embryo at a time. Some people are still transferring two at a time. We want to talk about timing because sometimes a surrogate is really urgent for her that she do this right away. Sometimes they need to wait a little while for whatever reason. Maybe they're still nursing their own child. Maybe they're healing from a previous pregnancy, etc. One of the most important things you have to make sure you are on the same page with a surrogate about are things about abortion or selective reduction. When you are involving a surrogate in your reproductive journey, you lose some control. And this is the place where you probably lose the most control because at the end of the day, it's her body and she's going to get to make the decisions about what happens to her body. So you need to make sure that she sees it the way you see it. What I hope to hear from most surrogates when the intended parents uh, want control over. Um, uh, choosing if they're going to terminate a uh, fetus with a medical or uh, physical abnormality um, is really, you want to hear that or the surrogates say, this is your baby, it's your decision. And that's, that's really what we're looking for. Um, we talk about a lot of things though in this agreement. We're going to talk about who is present at labor and delivery. Um, can the doctor update the, the parents with information as they go forward? Are there foods she can't eat? Are there places she can't travel? Are there activities she can't do? 
but we're never trying to make the life of the surrogate difficult. We're trying to just keep everyone safe and healthy and make sure that the legal parentage aspect actually works too and that everyone has proper insurance, etc. We talk about things like confidentiality. So for example, is she allowed to post things on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? Is she allowed to identify the intended parents? Or is this very private? Um, different people feel differently about this. Um, we also talk about if there's going to be future contact between the parties. And usually we don't put that as a legal aspect. So we say this is basically like not a legal obligation. But a lot of the time the surrogates want to know that once they give birth to this baby, that it's not necessarily like goodbye forever, but that they will actually have an opportunity to meet the child, have an opportunity to kind of hear how the child's doing. And the key really to having a good surrogacy experience is respect between all the parties. So who is a parent? I've touched on this a little bit through surrogacy. This varies province by province. It's important to note that there's no such thing as a pre-birth order in Canada. So we only have post-birth orders. Um, the province where the child is born generally will take jurisdiction with some very small exceptions. And you should assume that the child's gonna be born where the surrogate lives. So the strongest and best, most flexible laws are in Ontario and British Columbia, although more recently Saskatchewan too, and Manitoba is making a run for it to come join us in that uh, uh, progressive legislation, which is great. In Ontario and British Columbia and now Saskatchewan, you don't have to actually go to court to make you the parents anymore. You can just do a simple birth registration process, but you do have to understand there is a process that has to happen after the baby's born to make the intended parents the parents. We no longer in those provinces need DNA testing, no need for parent to have a genetic connection. It's non-heteronormative legislation and they recognize multi-parent families, so not only two parents. Um, so if you press the button again, you'll see my uh, British Columbia, Ontario and Saskatchewan, which isn't showing up, but those are all good. Provinces I want you to stay away from though are Quebec, um, because Quebec is the only place really in the country that says a surrogacy agreement is null and void. And we've never had a gestational surrogate try to keep a baby before in Canada. I'm not really worried about it happening. But if it was going to happen in Quebec, she would be successful. So I'd rather avoid Quebec. Um, and Prince Edward Island actually has fine legislation, but the bureaucratic process is really uh, obnoxious. So ideally, we stay away from there too. Um, gamete donation, a sperm and egg donation, and interestingly enough, although these processes are so incredibly different, retrieving eggs is so much more difficult than is retrieving sperm, the legislation is exactly the same. Um, and I'm not talking too much today about embryo donation. The only thing I really want to be clear about is it's donation, it's not adoption. The parents are the parents from the time the baby is born, assuming it's done like when the uh, intended mom carries the baby, when the intended parent carries the baby. If um, it's through surrogacy, then you have to go through the surrogacy process, but this is not an adoption of the child, it's a donation of genetic material. So types of donors are on a spectrum in Canada. So on one end, we have anonymous, and anonymous means someone's going to be anonymous forever. On the other end of the spectrum is we have known donors. And a known donor can be someone you know today, it could be your sister, it could be your, your you know, brother-in-law, it could be your friend, it could be your acquaintance, it could be your Starbucks barista, lots of different situations I've seen, but you could also meet someone through an egg donation agency for the purposes of donation. You don't see that happening with, there's no such thing as a sperm donor agency. So just to be clear, um, it's when you're looking for sperm donors, you're either looking for um, known uh, someone you know or just anonymous. Um, there's a little bit more flexibility with um, egg donors. In the middle between known and anonymous is something called open ID. And open ID is uh, an interesting situation where um, through the egg bank, sperm bank, or egg donor agency, when the child reaches the age of majority, they're allowed to contact that bank or agency and find out the identifying information of who the donor is. And that's you know a nice middle ground between known and anonymous. But the problem with that is there's a few things. One, you're relying on that egg bank or sperm bank or agency to still exist 19 years from now, 20 years from now, which they may or may not exist. You're also relying on them to have updated contact information for that donor, which they may or may not have. Um, finally, uh, you know, I do have to say that if that's very important to my clients, that they, that their child has uh, contact information for the donor when they reach the age of majority, I would recommend they enter into a known donor agreement. I think that's just the safer way to get it, go about it. So what do I need to know about the law and egg donation? 
it is illegal to purchase ova or sperm from a donor or a person acting on behalf of a donor. That actually, the wording of that is what gives us the loophole to enter to participate with egg banks because with an egg bank, if it's a proper egg bank, you're not purchasing from a donor or a person acting on behalf of a donor, you're purchasing from the egg bank, which is operating on its own behalf. But with a donor, you cannot buy over from her. Um, next slide, please. Sarah, just on that, so if an egg bank, how does the egg bank then get those eggs? It's a good question. So that's why we don't have Canadian egg banks right now. Okay. Because in Canada, that you know, an egg bank can't purchase the egg from a donor, and people aren't donating them altruistically to an egg bank. So people might altruistically donate to a person who they care about or who they want to know is going to be a parent, but you don't see people altruistically donating to an egg bank. So we have in the United States, particularly, we have a lot of um, uh, quite a number of egg banks who we import eggs from at this point. And those egg banks buy the eggs from the donor, which is illegal in Canada, but perfectly legal in the United States. And um, they pay her for her time and her risk, etc., cetera, um, which is illegal here, but legal there. Um, and then when a Canadian intended parent comes forward and wants to purchase it, that donor has long ago been paid. So now they're buying from the egg bank and not from the donor, which is really the loophole in our law. Um, you do have to be careful not every egg, not everything that calls itself an egg bank is really an egg bank. If they are just uh, retrieving because the intended parents come forward and you can see that money flowing to the donor, I would argue that that's actually not safe and it still is a violation of Section 7 of the Act. Um, but uh, so it depends how that egg bank operates. And it's, again, worth talking to a lawyer to make sure that it's okay. So regulations, just like for surrogacy, exist for donation, whether it's egg donation or sperm donation. And it's the same situation, other than the fact that no net lost wages at all are listed in the regulations, which makes no sense. I can have my sister who's donating to me. She lives in Thunder Bay. She's coming to Toronto for a retrieval. She's going to be here for at least two weeks. And we want her here because we want to do a proper job monitoring her, and then we don't want her running back home right away to get back to work. And we want to be able to reimburse her for her net lost wages because she shouldn't be out of pocket for it. Technically, that's a breach of the regulations, and that's a hole and a mistake, a gap in our legislation and our regulations. But the guidance document says you are allowed to do it in their opinion, that it's not a breach of Section 7. Again, it just highlights the problem with our act. So, Sarah, with this gap, because I know we've been talking about it for a while some time now, and yeah, how, um, how can this, this gap get fixed? So, the Health Canada, who is responsible for writing the regulations, believes that it's a statutory interpretation issue, that they are not able to fix that gap without a change to the legislation itself. So basically, we would have to change the legislation itself, which is not something Health Canada can do. It has to be the government that changes the legislation. Okay. So why should I enter into an egg donor agreement? Some people will say, well, I don't want to enter into an egg donor agreement. I don't have to. First of all, part of the reason you need to enter into it, and the most important, is it makes it clear who is a parent and who's not a parent. So in a province like Ontario that has great legislation, it does say a donor is not a parent, but it also says you and the donor and your partner can all be parents together. So you want to be clear we're not all being parents together, and it's only the donor who is a donor and the parents who are the parents. Um, but really a huge reason for me to to really recommend everyone enter into an egg donor agreement who's doing egg donation is if you want any um, obligations or rights in terms of information sharing, exchange of information with the donor, you don't have any rights about that and without this agreement. So the agreement, you can put in things like, must the donor advise um, if she has any children in the future? Must she, she advise on new health information she learns about herself or her family members? Must she advise if she donates eggs in the future and finds out a child was born that had a genetic issue? Um, if you want her to be obligated to tell you any of those things, you have to contract for it. Um, I also like putting in other things, things like warranties about health information that doesn't come up in blood tests. So for example, has she experienced Anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, et cetera, um, doesn't mean people won't necessarily go ahead, although they might not, but um, they might want to watch out for this um, in terms of their child, if this does have a genetic component or not. Um, your child may care about who the donor is and may not care about who the donor is, but if you want your child to have access to this donor when they reach the age of majority in particular, um, you can provide for that in an agreement and you can't really do that otherwise. Um, again, we also like to talk about what you can do with excess eggs or embryos. Are you allowed to donate them to someone else? Must you, donate, must you uh, destroy them? Can you donate them to science or research, et cetera? 
So how do I find an egg donor? Is an egg donor agency legal and are egg banks legal? So we've already talked about egg banks. Some are legal. Um, and you also have to make sure they work with Health Canada um, and are approved and that they actually have Section 8 consent regulation issues dealt with. It's also just all legal stuff. Um, so some egg banks really are perfectly legitimate and some aren't under our law. Um, how do you find a donor? Some people use someone they already know, which is great. They look to family or friends and some people are very open about it. Again, you're allowed to put on Facebook, et cetera, that you're looking for a donor if you want to. You just cannot offer to pay or um, really speak to someone who's less than 18 years old. And an egg donor agency is perfectly legal in Canada as long as they don't pay a donor. So unlike with the surrogacy agency where it's illegal to pay someone to arrange the services of a surrogate mother, there's no such law on um, arranging the services of an egg donor. So an egg donor agency is perfectly legitimate as long as they don't pay the donor and only reimburse them for you. Now, what is the difference between finding a donor and using an egg bank? So when I say a live donor or finding a donor, it could be someone you know, or it could be an anonymous donor through a donor agency. And there is no guarantee as to how many OVA are going to be retrieved if you're using a live donor. Um, that being said, all of the OVA from a cycle with a live donor belong to you unless you contract otherwise. So if she, you know, produces 18 OVA, if she produces 12, if she produces eight, those all belong to you. Um, and that's very different with an egg bank where you usually get five or six depending on what you contract for with the egg bank. Um, there is no guarantee with the donor that any embryos are going to be created. An egg bank may or may not guarantee at least one embryo will be created depending on which egg bank you use. Um, because you have so many more, you usually, not always, but very frequently obtain so many more eggs from a live donor, this is less likely to be an issue if you want a genetically related sibling in the future. You probably are going to have enough embryos left over to do that, or ideally you will. That's very unlikely with an egg bank. Um, with a big difference for me as a lawyer is that with a live donor, you can enter into an agreement with her and you can negotiate certain things like whatever information you want from her going forward, um, whatever medical information you want going forward, etc. cetera. Um, you can't do that with um, an egg donor through an egg bank. You don't have any access to her whatsoever. Um, there's also really no option to have a known egg donor through an egg bank. There is open ID and there is anonymous. With a live donor, you can choose any of known open ID or anonymous. Now, the difference between a known sperm donor and a sperm bank is very similar to the issues with um, uh, an egg bank and a live donor. So a sperm bank, we've had sperm banks for a very long time. We used to have something like 20 in Canada since our legislation changed in 2004. We only have really one national sperm bank. and We import about 95% of our sperm from American sperm banks or European sperm banks. A sperm bank, again, does not offer you the opportunity for a known donor. It's only anonymous or open ID. You cannot contract with a sperm donor through a sperm bank. You can't get more information. You should, I would like people to know or to look at donor sibling registry uh, to potentially uh, connect them with other um, parents of uh, donor siblings to their child, which is, I think, a great idea in terms of exchange of information. Um, there may be more choice with a sperm bank because a known donor, you're really limited to people you already know. Um, with a known donor, uh, there is no such thing as an anonymous live donor in uh, the sperm bank world. It's different in the, egg bank, in the egg donor world than it is in the sperm donor world. So with a known live donor, you can enter into an agreement with a donor and people do exchange information. And I find that community expects to exchange information and participates in that uh, very positively. Um, you don't have a huge pool to choose from. It depends how many people you know, really. Um, and depending on provincial law, it can be just as safe as a sperm bank. But I do think it's really important to think about your provincial law before you choose whether or not to use a known sperm donor. Um, so for example, in Ontario, up until uh, 2017, it really wasn't very safe, although we did it. Um, now it's quite safe. And it's, it's really not a problem. Same with British Columbia, same with Alberta, same with um, Manitoba at this point, I believe, um, and Saskatchewan. And a known donor has the opportunity to be cheaper depending on how you go about this process. I think that's it. So here's my contact information. My email is sarah at fertilitylawcanada.com. I don't recommend you phone during COVID. It's hard to reach people that way, but send an email and I'm great at uh, responding to questions and happy to chat. Um, do, if anyone has questions now, I'm also happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. That was so informative. And um, 
I mean, I've heard this information over and over and I um, can appreciate the work you do and the questions that patients would have or anyone that needs to access a surrogate or a donor um, because there are lots of questions and there are some areas where we're not really sure. So your expertise and guidance here is so, so um, appreciated. Well, thank you. So if anybody's got questions, uh, whether you are on Facebook with us right now or in Zoom, please know you can ask. Um, there is a question that's come in. Uh, Facebook, can we buy from an egg bank and also from the USA? Uh, I'm reading that out loud, but I think what she's saying is, so we can buy from an egg bank from in which US. is in the US. Mm -hmm. So it depends. I hate being giving a lawyer answer, but I can't help right. myself. Mm -hmm. So assuming that this is a legitimate egg bank and you're not saying, oh, please retrieve from donor one, two, three, four, and then the money flows to her, but it's actually an egg bank that exists that has retrieved the eggs it, or, already prior to your involvement from the donor in the United States, already owns those eggs in the United States. If you then pay that egg bank, that's legitimate under Section 7 of the Assisted Human Reproduction Act, because while you are purchasing OVA, you're not purchasing them from a donor or a person acting on behalf of the donor. So that is legitimate under the law. Great. And if someone has questions about whether or not, um, you know, some people will enter into this knowing that they need to use a surrogate or a donor in order to build their family. Some people may find out through their clinic. They may not know that this is an issue and that their only option may be a surrogate or a donor. At that point, would their clinic guide them uh, in the right direction or is it something that patients should really kind of take into their own hands a bit to um, get more information? What would be the process there? So I think your clinic can be a great resource depending on how much third party or production they do. But okay. you have to understand that if, if, if my best advice to be very honest is that you do want to take a little bit of a step back. Okay. Different clinics have different um, relationships with different organizations, but mm -hmm. you might be limited to whatever organization they happen to have a relationship with, and that might not be the right choice for you. So for example, some clinics will only be involved with egg banks, and some clinics will only be involved with live donors, and some clinics will only work with certain agencies. Um, you and some won't work with known donors at all, and some will not will not work with anonymous donors at all. So you want to be aware of all the options available to you, and then make the right choice for you. Um, and I, I think that's really important. So uh, I would take a step back again. I'm sorry to toot the horn no, your lawyer, great. but it's a good idea to talk with a fertility lawyer who can talk to you about all the different options available to you, and you can make that decision. Um, taking that into account too. The, it's a it's a long thing using that if you're using an egg donor for example you know it's not just getting pregnant it's like this is going to be your child and this is going to be your child's genetic makeup forever so you really want to think this one through um, in terms of surrogacy also i think there are quite a number of options out there um, and it's a good idea to inform yourself of the different options and the legalities around them and the experiences people have with them i think that's great advice to sort of take a step back um, and then, you know, at Fertility Matters, we always want to make sure patients or anybody who needs the information has all of the information and resources they need in order to make an informed decision. These are big decisions that we're making. Um, so I thank you for that because I do think it's great advice to sort of take a step back and talk to someone who's, um, who can help kind of guide you and give you a bit more information. So yeah. you feel at, um, incredibly comfortable with your decision. Uh, do you know the estimated cost of frozen donor eggs? So frozen donor eggs can be quite expensive and there's different, I can't give you an estimated cost because it depends what you're looking at too. So for example, there's some organizations where you're getting a lot of five eggs and that's it. There's some where you're getting a lot of six. There's some where you're getting a lot of six, but a guarantee. And, you know, and that, place where you're getting this guaranteed live birth you're, and it can be up to six mm -hmm. lots of six, you're looking at something around like 40,000 US dollars plus. It's very expensive. Um, and it definitely goes down from there. So there's a big range. Um, I do find that a relatively expensive way to uh, obtain your eggs, but it is a, it is a possibility. Thank you. Um, this is another message that's come in. The federal government allowing post-birth reimbursement of wages, so the top up, 
um, oh, sorry, my screen just jumped on me there, where the province of Ontario doesn't, does the federal law allow us to top up a surrogate's income to their usual pay rate at work? Okay, so it's not a difference between Ontario and federal law. Um, it's simply the idea is a surrogate is entitled to maternity leave because she gave birth. Um, and she, she may therefore be entitled to employment insurance if she pays into EI, mm -hmm. or she may be entitled to uh, wage loss benefits through her employer if she works for such an employer. Are you allowed to top up is a question of federal law. It doesn't change province by province. So technically under the regulations, you are not allowed. It doesn't list it. So arguably that'd be breach of section 12 of the act. However, Health Canada wrote a guidance document that says, we don't believe this is a breach of the act. Go ahead and do it. And the reason we didn't include it is there's a statutory interpretation issue. The problem with that is a guidance document is not actually, does not have the force of law. It's just, mm -hmm. I think like, if someone ever actually got in trouble for doing it, you'd have really something great to lean back on and say, well, Health Canada, who is basically the people who write the regulations say it's okay. And so, is this, so in your conversations with um, your intended parents or your surrogates, you would help walk them through sort of the steps to make. And at the end of the day, the decision, do, do people choose to top up? They do. Okay. Yeah, they do. I think people are, I mean, I've been really impressed with everyone I've met or almost everybody I've met. People are, they don't want to see a surrogate out of pocket. And mm -hmm. they also understand she just gave birth and she should be entitled to some time to recuperate. So people tend to top up for a little bit of time, not, not you know, 17 weeks, yeah. um, but a little bit of time to give someone a chance to recuperate from giving birth. And I think, I think that makes sense to me and I think it's fair. I've, I've actually yet to meet the intended parents who say we're not willing to take that risk. That's awesome. That's great news. Uh, I'm just popping over to our Facebook here. I have to see if an egg bank has guaranteed an embryo, will they give more eggs if none produce a viable pregnancy or I guess a viable embryo from the first batch? So it depends if that's a guarantee. If that's a guarantee, then they should. Mm -hmm. um, I can't just answer that. It's kind of like in a vacuum. I don't know the facts sure. of the situation. I don't know the quality of the sperm. I don't know any of those kind mm -hmm. of things. But assuming everything was actually met and assuming there was a guarantee, sure. Um, you. I often go through um, egg bank documents, uh, agreements with clients to explain to them what that specific egg bank is guaranteeing them and what it's not guaranteeing them. Um, and depending on the egg bank, sometimes we have to get a lot of things uh, written, like confirmed by email or in writing um, or changes made to the agreement to make sure that the things that they think are being guaranteed are actually being guaranteed in writing. Great, thank you. Well, we've... Um we're at the top of our, our of our time here. Um, thank you everybody for joining live. These sessions are always so important. We always learn so much. Um, and it's a great refresher for those of us who needed a bit of a refresher. So Sarah, thank you for your time. Thank you for this beautiful presentation and the information um, and for all of the work that not only you do for intended parents and surrogates and fertility patients and anybody who needs your services in uh, in Canada, but also for your long-term commitment to supporting all Canadian fertility um, patients, your volunteer work with Fertility Matters. It's incredibly important and we appreciate you so much. Well, thank you. Um, don't forget it is Canadian Infertility Awareness Week. We have live events with fertility experts all week. Please visit www.ciaw.ca for a list of events and to learn how you can get involved, share your stories, connect with community, connect with other um, fertility professionals and join us again live uh, this week for more information. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.